G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas, and few pursuits are quite as dangerous as poking fun at sacred cows which powerful elites think are beyond being made fun of. Andrew Doyle is a man who does just that. He's a political satirist, originally from Northern Ireland, but in the early days of wokeness, in the early 2010s, he was a man who noticed something happening on the left that was worthy of satirizing, and he created a parody account on Twitter of a fictional person called Titania McGrath. Now, this person soon acquired hundreds of thousands of followers for all of her insanely woke social justice tweets, but they were just plausible enough to convince a lot of people, and there was some confusion about whether or not she was a parody account or a real human being. She describes herself on Twitter as an ecosexual, radical intersectionalist poet with variable pronouns. Uh, she became legendary, and so did Andrew as a result. Andrew has also written for the parody character Jonathan Pye. Uh, he's written plays. He currently has a panel show on GB News, uh, where he argues for free speech and discusses culture war topics. He's written a couple of terrific books, uh, one of them, Free Speech and Why It Matters, the other, The New Puritans, How the Religion of Social Justice Captured the Western World. I was recently in London. This was just before the US presidential election, which Donald Trump won. And I sat down with Andrew Doyle to discuss satire, free speech, the working class, partisan politics, comedy, and the future of the left. Please enjoy the one and only Andrew Doyle. So someone's been calling you a, a white supremacist today. No, someone just is said, this a frequent occurrence? That, well, I mean, they, they, yeah, there are people, there are crazy people online who call me a fascist and far right and uh, homophobe I get quite a lot yeah um and uh yeah so why not white supremacists if you're just mm. making stuff up you may as well go the whole hog sure uh I think it's just it's a, no I got sent it someone sent me this tweet saying you realize this person's calling this and I, I I just said yes but people say people make things up online yeah uh, you know that's their but they don't think they're making it up do they they think do they you can't be someone who is so consistently and openly against racism as I am you can't pretend that I'm actually the opposite without lying i don't i think that's got to be deception mm -hmm. at that point might be self-deception maybe yeah you know there's that interesting thing of the creation of folk devils online the way in which people mischaracterize i mean a good example and what you know obviously back in the day all of my friends were on the left and they used to talk about some people i know rather well now on the right conservative commentators they used to call them you know monsters these people are evil mm. genuinely mm. evil and they mm. Or, and then now that I know these people, I realize it's it's the precise opposite. They're very generous and kind and all the rest of it. So, mm. you know, there is a, a way, I suppose, that people, particularly in tribal groups, political tribal groups, conjure an image of someone who doesn't exist and then and then proceed with that image. Yes, yeah, that does. It's an interesting psychological thing. I mean, I'm not, I've got no expertise in anthropology or psychology, so I don't know why. You do. You do in the sense of having been part of it. Like, you know, you've got... studied it. I don't, know no. why, I don't know why they do the things they do. Because, I mean, the generous way of interpreting a remark like white supremacist is the tribal one, right? Where they yes. they have, they believe that there's, that there are good sides and bad sides and that, you know, there's dark, there are forces of darkness and you're, you have yes. proven your, you've either failed to prove your bona fides on being on the right side of history Yes. By, you know, there are things that you've not, you've refrained from saying, or there are things that you've been willing to say. Maybe. The only people in the tribe of white supremacists would say. And bear in mind, the, you know, these are the same people who compared Lord Tony Sewell, who was the head of the Commission on Race and Ethnic Disparities, to the, uh, to Joseph Goebbels, I believe. Right. Um, and they did that on the ground. Why only Goebbels? Why not Hitler? Why, why all the way? Maybe because he's black, they thought they couldn't go all the way. Right. But they were most of the way. Yeah. And all because he, you know, he commissioned this report and, and ran this rigorous report hmm. into the notion of systemic racism into UK institutions, including schooling, and found no evidence of it. Right. Um, because it was like Goebbels to me. Rivera was a big fan of commissioning, uh, yeah, anti-racism. He wanted to find out, yeah, about that kind of stuff. The bottom of it, yeah. yeah. Goering would be another good one. Yeah, uh, I like. Uh, sometimes people will call you Mussolini, so that they don't have to commit the Hitler fallacy because Hitler's a bit lazy. You know? Oh, is like, Mussolini like a sort of gateway to a sort of step yeah. towards, but not quite all the way? I think if people, I think if stupid people don't want to seem like they're reaching for the lazy analogy, yeah, they go, I know how I'll be clever. I'm not going to say Hitler because everyone said that. Yeah, I'll say. Uh, Goebbels or say Mussolini ah uh, okay yeah well he was a he was a wrong one as well which one <laughs> Mussolini that's say one of them I'm gonna go with all I think you can say yes I think, I think you can safely say that yeah um, my cousin in Italy once took me to Mussolini's grave which is uh, it's because your cousin's a fascist uh, actually the opposite I mean he's he, he, he was a complete 
obviously he hated Mussolini and everything he stood for, but he was fascinated by this weird place in Italy called Pradapia where Mussolini was born. And when his body got, it got dragged all over the place uh, and smuggled around the place, and when it, it finally eventually ended up, up back in this small village, Pradapia. Uh, but it's a weird thing because they've got the big tomb, the big Mussolini head. Right. It's normally guarded by a black shirt. Thank God there wasn't one of them while I was there. But it's Presum- presumably a metal head, not an actual soft head of... No, I wouldn't be that. intrigued. That'd be nice. It was actually Mussolini's head. Uh, that, I think that was gone. I think that was, the bits were torn off and all right, that. Right, okay. But that, I mean, that's an interesting village because the village itself is a tiny, small village in Italy. Um, but because of his influence, when he became leader, he went back and redecorated in this grand art deco style. So it's, <laughs> it's a weird place proper dodgy people though so no, i'm not obviously smearing a whole village no i'm just saying i you just some... you just say you're racist against italians no i'm saying i saw a couple of shops there that were openly selling nazi par- paraphernalia oh, and that okay. and that troubled me quite yeah that's yeah. nice yeah uh, so you said that you have you used to have a lot of friends on the left yeah what does that mean i know where it's... are you now uh i normally lose about three or four a year of the ones that are remaining, it's it's a it's how like many a, friends do you have? I couldn't lose three or four a year without doing. It. I'd run out pretty soon. I'm using friends in the in the in, right, okay, in the kind of um broader term, right? I would say maybe sphere of acquaintances. We could say acquaintances. Um, yeah, that's right because they do say you only really have like a handful of yeah friends. Yeah. But, um, okay, but but every now and then <laughs> something will happen. Uh, someone I used to know on the comedy circuit who I knew pretty well would suddenly chip in online and call me something awful and mm. and it's oh okay well there's another one i'll delete his number and what i'm mostly objecting to like where did the obviously is a good example yeah um so a comedian who I, i've gigged with many times over many years um suddenly reacted very badly to an article i'd written about librarians uh because i was pointing out that the uh whatever this ideology is you want to call it woke or critical social justice or whatever uh, that it is, has taken a particular hold in the sphere of librarianism, which is objectively true, and I have the evidence to prove that. The fact that the British the British Library has a uh, decolonizing working group that has even openly claimed that the the main building of the bi- a library is colonial because it because it looks a bit like a battleship. So that's the kind of people we're dealing with. They they created a watch list of the authors who had connections to the slave trade going back centuries, um, including Ted Hughes. Let's take him off when they realised that wasn't true. They just made it up. Right. Um, but the, but but I made this point about librarians, and there is a weird thing. There's loads of um, not just anecdotal, but but studies which have shown that librarians, staff in libraries are hiding books that they deem to be problematic or, or not stocking certain books. Yeah. I think Helen Joyce... The, that's the Enlightenment spirit, isn't it? Right, exactly. Yeah. Helen Joyce's book, uh, no. Trans, was compared to uh, Mein Kampf uh, in one um, library report. See, that's the lazy Hitler analogy yeah, again. You should find Mussolini's book yes. or Goebbels' book, compare it to that, more creative. Did Mussolini write a full book? Not sure. He wrote a treatise on fascism, which was an essay with a philosopher called Gentile, I think. Okay. Um, you know an alarming a lot about European fascism in the 1930s. Now I'm, I'm just, hoisting myself with my own... Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's fine. It's actually, gotcha. no, yeah, I'll just pretend I know nothing about it. Like. Yeah. So, and so you they were, you wrote an article about librarians. That got you in trouble. Oh, yeah. He, What's the... Yeah. He came in and started saying... How well, dare you? Can I swear on your podcast? You can. He came in and called me a cunt, and wow. and uh, out of nowhere, just straight off the bat, uh, because I was making this point about librarianism, and, and and he said I was being a reactionary, all this sort of stuff. And then I was blocked, um, inevitably. And then uh, I thought, okay, uh, you know, I wasn't close to him, I you know, but I thought it was weird because we got on really, really well. Mm. Um, but that sort of thing happens every now and then. It's just another one. You just say, oh, there's another one. I'll have to delete then. And I, I'm quite resigned to it now. You know, I just I just sort of accept it as a fact of life now. Mm, that's a bit depressing, isn't it? Uh, maybe. Although I keep being reassured that people who behave that way aren't really friends anyway. And they're just, yeah. kind, of, they're just kind of outing themselves uh, for who they really are. So what do you say to the people who say sort of the, the, the whole kind of cancel culture thing is a, a bit... That what basically, you're beating a dead horse, kind of. Like, that. yeah, there was like a brief moment of kind of woke insanity in the you know in 2020 and 2021 and the left got went a bit crazy but now people are generally sort of putting their hands back on and then well you're speaking as you sounded like a historian from the 2050s you know i don't think we're there by some measure yet right you know and i know every now and then people say oh have we reached peak woke is this it now and you see what you're doing i think is seeing signs of people being alert to the problem now when they weren't a couple of years ago and that is true 
Um, but you, what you, you still haven't rectified, not you, but society hasn't rectified is the, uh, well, I haven't either, to be fair. Well, how could you? Yeah. It's the way in which these things are embedded in, in all of the major institutions to, to extreme lengths. Germany has just introduced a self ID law, which will fine citizens for misgendering, fine them 10,000 euros. And you know, that they're effectively fining people for not using the language that's compelled speech. Uh, I would have thought in a country like Germany with a history of with its history, let's not go into it again. <laughs> they, they it's might... funny that you raised that country of all the countries in Europe. It's just because I've been reading about it today, or is it? But, exactly. But, the, but they do now have... Uh, it's not coincidental that their history leads to their position on that because they do have an extremely anti-fascist sort of you know ethos which can itself become fascistic in the sense in the sense uh-huh. that they're a country where it's illegal to say nazi like things they're a country where it's illegal to fly a swastika they're a, they're like we're not going to do any of that yeah we're going to be super nice and if you're not nice we're not going to be nice are you saying they sort of find another outlet for their fascistic tendency? i mean maybe that's an unkind way of putting it but maybe anti teutonic it doesn't feel <laughs> nice there i would i would suggest that they're just following a trend that is pretty much broadly uh, growing across the Western world, I don't think it is slowing down particularly. I think I think it's it has less support from the public. But since when did the woke movement require popular support to impose its values? It never has. It's always well. Been what it bit. had was the acquiescence of the cowardly. Sure, and it may be that there's more of a quorum now of people who aren't cowardly. Potentially, but what can they really do about it? I mean, you know, it it, it dominates the government in America at the moment, and. What is it more in common? Estimated only 8% of Americans fit into the category of woke, what we would describe as woke, that ideology, a tiny minority, but they have all the power. I How do you describe it, the ideology? Do you want a full description? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I would say it is a uh, a movement that is grounded in the postmodernist notion that our understanding of reality is wholly constructed through language deriving from the Foucauldian and, and French uh, postmodernists of the 1960s, in addition to a kind of mistrust of the masses, which is kind of drawn from the Frankfurt School, I would say, predominantly. Uh, And that this uh, identity-obsessed mania, uh, anti-working class, a very sort of upper-middle-class movement, uh, has come to the fore with an obsession uh, about language and an obsession about control. Uh, I'd say its key characteristics are a belief in censorship, the idea that we can can control what people say, then you can control their thoughts, and you can create a kind of utopia. I would say they have an obsessive uh, notion of lived experience or the idea of multiple ways of knowing, in other words, the destabilization of the very notion of truth. And ultimately, they from Foucault, they've drawn this idea of power structures in society, the idea that, 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 is, that power dominates every human relation and you can effectively divide humanity into two classes, the oppressor and the oppressed. And everything has to be seen through that lens and through the lens of group identity, which is why intersectionality is such a, an essential part of it. Yeah, I, I, I'll buy the second and third ones, lived experience and um, power structures being dominant. The censorship thing doesn't strike me as a preserve only of wokeness. It's not that all of the backlash to wokeness is deeply censorious exactly. as well. This is something that I've been at pains to keep hammering away about. It's that authoritarianism is an aspect of the woke movement, but it is not an aspect that is exclusive to the woke movement. I would say that authoritarianism is embedded in, in humanity. It's part of our instinct. I think everywhere, every child knows that when someone's hurting them or upsetting them, they just want them to shut up and go away. I, 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 this, this, I really worry about this, that there's now I'm seeing more and more people on the right who in reaction to the excesses of the woke left now think that authoritarianism is the way to deal with it. So they'll say things like, we should uh, ban gay marriage. We should never have had gay marriage to begin with. They say we should ban pro-Palestine protests. Uh, We should ban certain people from speaking on campus. They're doing exactly the same Mm. uh, that the woke do. Now, they don't have the institutional power that the woke have, um, but they will tomorrow. Well, I mean, yeah, exactly. And there are some, there are some, I mean, there are governors in the United States who are, you know, uh, talking about withholding funding for educational institutions and so on. You can't put this into size. Like, I think the the, the, the big uh, misnomer about the culture war is that people have tried to understand it as a conflict between left and right. And if you're seeing it in those terms, you're not understanding the culture war. The culture war is a conflict between liberty and authority. That's what's going on here. It's those who believe in liberty and freedom and free speech and freedom of the press and freedom of assembly and those people who don't. And that's where the true conflict lies. I mean, we've had 
obviously a lot of gender critical feminists have been on the anti-woke side, but I've seen recently a lot of them talking about how uh, we should um, ban or discriminate against people who identify as trans when it comes to housing or employment, uh, or, or even people sort of insinuating that we should we should restore the idea that cross-dressing should be against the law. I mean, you know, when they raided the Stonewall Inn back in 1969, you know, they were looking for people who were wearing more than three items of clothing from the opposite sex because that would violate the state law. You know, the, this kind of authoritarianism is not unique at all uh, to one movement. So when I talk about uh, censorship being part of the woke movement, I, I really want to emphasize, I don't think they invented it. Right. In fact, yes, they just seem to have jumped onto a bandwagon that the right had gotten very good at. But the but censorship, so what are we meaning by censorship? Because well, there's it, always well, a... The yeah. example of Germany is a good one, isn't it? That That's not just, that goes beyond censorship. That's not people saying you can't say certain things. It's saying you must say certain things. Right. And that's very much a woke idea. I mean... I mean, it's, it's people It's people on that side of the argument that are cheerleading the online safety bill in the UK, that are cheerleading major multi-billion dollar corporations mm. uh, to shut down certain forms of speech. I don't see, or colluding, as it was when, when Twitter was colluding with the CIA and the FBI to shut down certain opinions. I, I don't see how you could see this as anything other than uh, an attack on free speech and an attack on... So, I mean, th yes, so there's definitely, there's definitely that. The reason why I'm pausing is because there's a backdrop to these conversations that I feel goes unremarked upon too frequently, which is that there is always a shifting vanguard of acceptable discourse. Yeah, right? sorry. You, know, you go back and you read newspapers from the 1950s, let alone the 1920s, and the way that they talked about black people and women was just appalling exactly. by today's standards. And the only way that that ever changed was by people who at the time were perceived as being uppity wokesters, uh, you know, imposing some kind of penalty for people who spoke that way and saying, no, we've got, we've now got new standards about the way that we speak. Yeah. So to some extent, I try to understand like what's going on now through the prism of like not trying not to be one of those old guys who was waving his fist at young people these days and yeah. resisting change because probably some of the things that woke people over the past five years have been saying we shouldn't do, we probably shouldn't do like yeah, maybe well i mean the mute taboos are okay i would disagree with the premise insofar as um the most effective forms of progress have been actuated through a process of protest uh registering objections and a, a kind of gradual form of, of persuasion that is a that has meant that ultimately uh the 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 overton window has shifted uh there's there's a broad consensus emerges over a long period of time when change comes through force uh it it generally doesn't last very long uh and it's certainly i mean to give the best example the most effective engine of change in terms of any movement from the past hundred years has been the civil rights movement has been the liberal project from the 1960s onwards uh it is through that process of uh open discussion persuasion the early years of stonewall were all about we're not going to force we're not going to say we're going to have you arrested for saying things about gay people, we're going to explain to you and talk to you about the fact that gay people are just the same as you. Mm. Get a conversation going. That's why the vast majority of people in this country now support gay rights, not because someone said we're going to lock you up if you don't. And I think it's it's right, but but carve off the question of like uh, of state sanction, right? Yeah, and actually punishing people or fining people, or the German example. Uh, you know, take you know the the fact that you can't call people fags anymore. Well, that was. Well, that, but the, the taboos, like social taboos. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. With you're, you. not, you're not supposed to do it. And the people who originally said, uh, oh, come on, stop calling people that, were seen as being a little bit puritanical. Yeah, sure. That's right. That, but that's how ch you have to take the risk. That's how change is affected by, by people who have this courage. Isn't, isn't there a modern day version of that, which is the people yeah, who people. are saying like... The liberals. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's people on my side of the argument saying you shouldn't be saying that. Criticism, because criticism is part of free speech. I mean, I've had this recently over the past few days. There's all these uh, people who identify as gender critical feminists going online because they've had some horrible remarks by gay people calling all gay people faggots and saying you're all disgusting, virus ridden perverts and stuff. Now, I'm criticizing that. And people are saying, oh, you're trying to shut us down. No, this is part of free speech. Criticism of that kind of thing to develop and redevelop um, the social contract. Right. But 10 years ago, if someone had said, you should call a person who wants to be called they, them, they, them, wouldn't you have said, oh, that's a bit silly? What, 10 years ago? Yeah. Would I have said it's a bit silly? I mean, not you, but one one would have. And the only way that it becomes well, they still not do, silly. Don't they? 
Well, no, I think most people now would, would do that. No, that most people now... <laughs> they wouldn't. Would use they, them. No, no. This is another example. Uh, the idea... You don't think most people no, know it was taken on other on. person's pronouns? It hasn't caught on. The idea of they, them as a singular pronoun just simply hasn't caught on in the language. You find this, it's caught on within the, uh, the captured institutions, within the media, but you'll find that the vast majority of people, when they read one of those articles using they, them for Sam Smith, but halfway through the article, they can't work out who, who, is that, who they're actually talking yeah. about. Like it doesn't make sense yeah, journalism because the person, I mean, presumably the person hasn't explained it well enough. But I mean, it just cannot be terrible. Let's not, let's not use trans them. Maybe maybe that's maybe we're still five or ten years behind on that. No, no, no. But that's a fact. Not to know that, but that is a good example. The idea of there was an attempt to impose they and them as a singular pronoun on the population through force, through bullying, through threats of misgendering, arrest. Some some people have actually been arrested for that, uh, and it didn't work. And the most time when you talk to people, it just hasn't caught on. It really, really hasn't. But the media will tell you that it has because within their little world... Well, I'm probably in too much of an elite circle, but I mean, it, it is understandable to me that when someone claims that they want to be called they, them, that people generally respect that. But you may be right that that hasn't well, sort of beyond my... It's not about respect. I think it's disrespectful to do so because what they're asking you to do is to completely bypass the way that our shared thing which is language the the thing that we all share the thing that we prevents us from elitism is that we all have these standards of language it's a, it's a it's a really good thing that enables everyone in society to 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 run on a level playing field and they're saying no we want to change the way that everyone in society uses language even though it's inelegant even though it doesn't make sense oh, even I'm though saying, it confuses yeah, things i'm saying that that happens all the time i'm saying that the, the but no one's done it well calling Calling an actress an actor, yeah, like that that worked, and it was by people so saying they didn't confuse the language. Okay, that, but that's why I say that they them might be a bad example. You're, okay. you know, to, to take for example the you know the taboo against the n word, right? Which we all sort of know is a little bit silly. Yeah, yeah. That, that when I say the n word is the worst word in the world, and you should never use it against anybody, and you should never use it as a slur. Yeah, that it's a bit silly for me to think that anyone would actually genuinely think that it's truly offensive if I had actually just said the word in that context. That, there, that we all know that there's a difference but, between me so calling someone the word and me talking about the word. But nonetheless, people have successfully changed the norm around that yeah. to such an extent that I now do do that. And ten years ago, I would have thought I'm never going to be the type of person well, you're, who's you're going to do that. You're entirely agreeing with me. Because I'm talking about the way in which language evolves through societal cooperation. Go well, ahead. exactly what's happened. What it doesn't do, and what it doesn't tend to do, historically speaking, it doesn't evolve through threats, intimidation, and, and attempts at censorship. I'm saying there were people at that time who thought that the, the, the reasons why we were changing were due to threats. Give me an I, example. Well, I mean, you know, it was due to a, a certain amount of threat and punitive action that people who used the N-word were <laughs> publicly dissuaded from using it. I don't think so. Yeah. I, think it, I think it was to do were a number of high profile examples of people saying, you know, uh, wait a second, did the person actually say? Or, yes, but I would, or, argue, I would argue that those examples were not the reason that change occurred. The reason that change occurred is because there was a, a civil rights movement uh, that explained to people and opened up this idea that we are all the same. Uh, there was also uh, no. I think no. I think you're being a bit cute there. I mean, there, there was. Bit, well, what's or, what's more effective? Martin Luther King's "I Have a Dream" speech, hmm. or some unnamed because you haven't given me an example yet. Some unnamed example of someone being incarcerated for using the N word. Mike Pesca, um, you know, who hosted the uh, the the daily podcast at uh, was it Slate uh, was talking on a on slack in like 2021 yeah. about this case of the new york times reporter who had been fired from the times for using the word with uh, a bunch of he was uh, uh, on a trip in south america and yeah. he was talking to some younger people and he said wait again wait did did she actually say and he said uh, the uh, he wasn't being racist he was just, he wasn't being racist he was just talking about the word and he got fired from the new york times yeah. and then there was a conversation about whether or not it was appropriate to ever use the word in conversation and mike pesca was saying on slack he didn't even use the word but he was arguing for the legitimacy of using the word in conversation so isn't that an example of what i'm he, talking about well where someone's been well, he's fairly treated by, and I mean, I presume most right-thinking people didn't think that he deserved that. Mm, no, but nonetheless, his then. punishment made an example of him and made us all fall into line. So I'm just saying, like, I'm not saying it's a good thing that culture works this way, but I am saying that part of cultural progress yeah, involves the punishment of, of yeah, and and rest of a new taboo. And I'm saying that when you do that, what you will get very, very quickly is a backlash. And we've already talked about it. It's already started. So that kind of thing, the unjust principles of what we call cancel culture, 
will not work ultimately. They work in the short term. I mean, you've just described a good example. I can give you a million examples of people who've lost their jobs and careers. And yes, there are a lot of people who've gone through some terrible things because of that prohibitive and pre precisionist uh, way of thinking about the world. Um, but ultimately, it's not going to happen. The backlash is already starting. You said it yourself. You're actually more optimistic than me. You think things are over by now. There will be a point, maybe well, in about... No, no, I, I didn't say that. I mean, I said, what do you say to people who do say that? Okay, well, uh, that's yeah, on well I think, but I think in like a few years' time, with if if liberalism is restored, if the liberal project gets back on track, it will be considered ridiculous that someone could even be fired uh, for that. It will be considered inconceivable. That example that you just described, I think, is one of those things that historians in 20, 30 years will look back and say, they went mad for a while. And here's yeah, the right. Yes, I think that's probably true. But, but the, the better example would be, as I say, Stonewall with the gay rights movement, right? And the gay rights movement, you can point to moments of, I suppose, violent resistance like Stonewall. Yes. Although that was a self-defensive thing, to be honest. Um, and, but that wasn't the thing. Stonewall in of itself actually didn't do anything. It's really overblown in terms of what those uh, riots achieved. What really achieved change was the group of people the next year who decided to set up the Christopher Street Parade in commemoration of Stonewall and do it every single year. People like Fred Sargent. Um, and that, the peaceful protest gathering, the collective the uh, gradual persuasion of society, the realignment of society, the opening up of basic humanity and the understanding of what gay people are, that was what changed society, not a few people throwing bricks at windows. So as this current moment began, this sort of woke, you know, social justice uh, movement began, uh, you, your character your on Twitter of Titania became, like, was the, probably the first time that I ever noticed someone making a, strong satirical point about this phenomenon that we hadn't quite yet named yeah but it was easy because i was anonymous so that so the, i didn't get the abuse and well i mean i'm just interested now in pivoting to how that came about like what what were you what were you seeing that others weren't and um, how did you invent it i wasn't seeing what other people weren't I, I a lot of people were recognizing that this was absurd that this was a problem uh, and a lot of people were talking about it, but just not in the professional comedy world. That was what was weird about it. That's what I thought was very odd. I see. I mean, um, there were whole internet subcultures of people mocking this and attacking this, and all of that was going on. You know, I didn't invent that. Um, but what was weird to me is that, you know, if, if, if I made a joke that leaned towards that kind of thing on the stage, I would have other comedians saying, that's not, you shouldn't be doing that. And so it was kind of... That was what I found very weird mm. because comedians and satirists have always mocked closed systems of thought. They've always mocked uh, uh, um, people in power. I consider this a very powerful movement. But for some reason, this one particular thing was suddenly ring fenced and it, uh, that didn't make any sense. What was the thing at this stage? Like, how would you define it? Because it was a very different movement, I think, in those early yeah. days. Well, it was, it was ultimately the same insofar as it was. It was essentially self-satirizing. This is the thing. It was a group of people largely middle class, as I say, largely very privileged, berating everyone else about privilege. So it's already quite funny. It's people who are determined to see fascists in every shadow. Uh, you know, study after study after study reveals that the UK has become more and more progressive over many, many decades. This is all irrefutable. And yet, and yet, they were saying we're effectively living in the Fourth Reich. So that kind of group fantasy, group hysteria is already quite funny, except that these people were also gaining a lot of power. And it started creeping in then, didn't it? You had like... Um, what like, was this, by the way? What you, so I reckon creator. you could date all of this stuff from the sort of 2012, 2013. Yeah. yeah. And that certainly does tally uh, with the sudden leap in, in certain phrases from the woke lexicon in, in the media. There's a way to search for this. I can't remember how it is, but there's somewhere that where it's all collated. You can see yeah. phrases like toxic masculinity or, 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 or cisgender or whatever it might be suddenly spike at that point. Lived experiences and other ones and all of those kind of um, slogans. And it happened around then. Uh, and it, it, it was this odd concatenation of, of, of uh, queer theory and critical race theory and things to do with group identity all coming together. Uh, but whereas, obviously, you know, you had the civil rights movements, which were, which were dealing with group identity, gathering in order to uh, affect change for their own interests. What well, they weren't doing is, as I said, they weren't doing it through authoritarian means. Right. So the big difference with the woke movement, the reason why the woke movement is the antithesis of the civil rights movement is because the civil rights movement, all branches of it, women's rights, black rights, gay rights, all believed that it had to be through free speech at the core, through open discussion and debate. Uh, the woke movement 
didn't. The woke movement effectively took the ideals of the civil rights movement and kind of processed it through an authoritarian way. In other words, be kind or else. Well, I'd go one step further and say there's another fundamental difference, which was that other civil rights movements were universalist, whereas there's yeah. something anti-universalist about about modern social justice in the sense that, yeah. you know, the, 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 the feminist or black civil rights movements of the 60s or whatever, the argument and the gay rights movement, you know, subsequently, the argument, the case was was founded on principles that a, a large majority of people already believe in, which yeah. are egalitarian principles of like, look, all we want are the same things that you've got. We want to be able to rent houses without discrimination. We want to be able to get married to our loved ones. We want, you know, we all agree that these things are good and we all yeah. agree that all people are created equal. So why can't we share in this as well? well Whereas it's persuasive, isn't it? It's good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Whereas more recently it's been like, well, this group has traditionally had too much dominance and power. Therefore, this other group has to, you know, be enacted in a war against this over a finite pie. And it all becomes rather antagonistic it's and very, it's, it's that thing of collectivism. It's seeing everyone not as individuals, but through the, the group identity that they represent. It's really anti-human. I wonder sometimes whether that's why a lot of woke activists use that phrase bodies. You know, they say yeah. uh, bodies of color or, or queer bodies and stuff. It's kind of reducing people to flesh, to meat. To, to, to something that isn't really human. It's interesting, isn't it? I've noticed that as well and tried to understand what that rhetorical move is. It's often used in terms of like, you know, the trampling of queer bodies or the crushing of black bodies. Yeah, the it's, historical. I find it really grotesque. It is quite, I mean, it's powerful. I'll grant them that. They're onto something because it, you have a sort of visceral reaction to like, oh, I don't want to be part of something yeah. that damages human bodies. So I think it comes from a dehumanizing stance. I think it comes mm. from this idea of not really seeing people as people. And, I mean, look at the reaction to Kemi Badenoch becoming leader of the Conservative Party. I mean, I posted a, uh, an article. Explain to non-Brits what you uh, Yeah, okay. So uh, Kemi Badenoch is a black woman who has become leader of the right-wing party in the UK. Uh, and this has riled up all the right people. So, I mean, you know, the I posted an article saying why I think she would make a good prime minister ultimately. And I speak as someone who's never voted conservative. I'm not a, a, a typical or traditional supporter of that party. Um, but I posted this article and I had lots of openly racist uh, tweets about her from ethno-nationalist, white nationalist, uh, far right types. At the same time, I was seeing far left uh, people in the Labour Party, in the Labour government, commentators, authors, basically being just as racist in a different way. I think one guy, one author called her the black face of white supremacy, right. had Labour MPs just basically basically saying how she's not really black. You know, mm. I mean, we've had, Uncle Tom. It's that phrase is so awful, that and coconut and all these sorts yeah. of stuff that people come out with. And you can see it, you can see the way that when you think collectively, when you think in terms of collectivism, whether that is from an ethno-nationalist uh, far right background or whether it is from an identitarian woke left background that what you are doing is you are dehumanizing people you're not seeing they're not seeing her for her skills her, her talents her experience her policies they just see her face and her skin color and that's it i mean now, is it not also possible that they're criticizing the collectivism of the conservative party and the identitarianism of the conservative party how was cynic in cynically putting her in power i don't know why she was chosen but if it were true that she was chosen because the conservatives want to look less like the party of old white men, as I mean, they I haven't intentionally choose a woman of color. I haven't seen that. To be fair, I saw it. I saw it about four or five years ago. Whenever the when was it? The, the Tory cabinet was predominantly ethnic minority people for a, a short period of time, and I did see it then. I saw commentators saying they're only doing this to cover their yeah, faces. Right. But I think because that got such that was it's such an obviously lame argument. Um, you know, you know, it, I mean, that's commitment, isn't it? Um, to your cause. <laughs> That I don't think people are doing that now. I, I really haven't seen that with the... Uh, right. I'm not, I'm not saying it's not happening. I just haven't seen it. So I don't think it's very a very mainstream approach. Mm. I mean, the like, idea that conservatives as a deeply racist... But this would be the theory, that the Conservative Party is so racist, so white supremacist, that they will actually have a black woman lead it in order just to cover and conceal their white supremacy. I mean, if they are racist, then they deserve some uh, credit for going to those lengths <laughs> to conceal it, surely. <laughs> I mean, you're caricaturing how how intense their racism would have to be. It's, I mean, in the same way that I mean, it's like, bonkers, right? That's that's crazy. Well, I mean, we isn't it one of those things where everyone just sort of knows what's going on, but we don't really talk about it. Like, I mean, the, uh, Kamala Harris being the vice president, you know, her being a woman and being yeah, a woman different. of color was obviously salient, and we all knew it, but we sort of don't really. No, but that's different because Joe, Joe Biden explicitly said he was going to hire a black <laughs> a woman. Had he not said that, we would still know that that 
comes into it. I mean, we might have suspected, sure. But I mean, the fact that it was explicitly stated is a different thing. I would have thought the the, the election of that's very different because that's Joe Biden specifically the individual Joe Biden picking a, a VP. That's not the same as the party membership voting for a leader. Right. That has to it. have a majority. Right. If the party is deeply racist, I'm sorry, racist people, you know, it's like that thing of when people mock you, if you say, well, if people, someone says I've got black friends and I say, well, that doesn't mean you're not racist. It's like, it sort of actually does. <laughs> you know, it, it, I don't understand why that's a thing that gets yeah. you into size. Yeah. Like, well, I mean, this also brings us to the sort of perversion of language that has come about with what racist even means now, because, right. uh, you know, yeah, exactly. we've, we've, we've gone from a, uh, a world in which we were talking about, you know, don't have animosity towards people on the basis of the color of their skin. Yeah. Which again, comes back to this universalist conception of, uh, of anti-racism to a new form of uh, anti-racism where it's actually not about uh, antipathy towards the, the person because of the color of their skin. It's about exactly. your complicity in a superstructure of white supremacy that sort of it, you know invades every subtle er, feel of life. It sounds, it sounds of, religious. A little bit. Yeah. A little I mean, bit. It, and, and for things to flip to that extent, you know, the fact, you know, if you think about it, you know, we've got at the moment the major gay rights organizations like GLAAD and American Stonewall in this country actively working against the interests of gay people, right? This is flipped completely. You've likewise got a... You want respect, just to unpack that. Uh, well, let me come back to that in a minute because okay. that's a big... Uh, yes. uh, that will take a while. Uh, the other example I was going to give um, was uh, the question of race. You have Robin D'Angelo, a white woman, in her book problematizing the notion of colorblindness most famously espoused by Dr. Martin Luther King. So what you effectively have is a, a black civil rights icon being called racist by a white woman who earns 12 grand every hour when she goes into a corporation to berate everyone for being evil and racist. That's flipped completely. The power has gone shifted back towards the, the white woman, right, in that situation. When it comes to Stonewall, for instance, Stonewall has explicitly redefined uh, homosexuality on its website and pro promotional materials and said that homosexuality doesn't mean same-sex attracted. It means same gender attracted. It means that men aren't, gay men aren't attracted to other men. They're attracted to some inherent uh, essence, a kind of soul that that man has. In other words, uh, and in fact, Nancy Kelly, who was the CEO of Stonewall for some years, she said that uh, she compared lesbians, women who didn't want to date individuals with penises, to sexual racists. So you have, and Grinder, Grinder, which is a gay hookup site, now says that you're not allowed to filter out women, women who identify as men, but you're not allowed to do that because that would be bigotry, right? But men who don't want to sleep with women aren't bigots, they're homosexual. And you would think Grinder, which has made so much money off gay men and their sexual appetites, might be the first to understand that rather than shaming people. So I think all the people who are being, who claim to be pro-gay, shaming gay people for being gay, that's now really, really normal. Uh, and we just kind of accept that, and I don't know why. Right. Well, you do know why, because there's a taboo against being anti-trans, and it's perceived as being anti-trans to assert that a I trans understand. woman is not a woman. I understand the logic. I don't know why that has in any way caught on. You know, normally when it comes to these sort of uh, curious belief systems, there's more skepticism. Well, okay. why has it caught on, uh, uh, you know, on the basis of your earlier skepticism towards my articulation of the way that social progress sometimes happens and yeah. sometimes it is punitive and sometimes people do, do in the case of the N-word, just get cowed into complying and then it becomes a norm and everyone goes, all right, well, I suppose it was all right that we sort of got cowed and there were a few eggs broken on the way to making yeah. the omelette. I wasn't, we do the omelette now. I wasn't disagreeing that some of it's punitive. What I'm saying is, historically speaking, we know that those punitive measures don't actually have long-term effects. So, well, aren't you saying that it is working now with the trans? Well, sure. within, within, yeah, definitely. With it, with, this is another good example. Within these few years of lunacy, which historians will come up with a phrase for, I don't know what it will be at the moment. We're living through it, so it's difficult for us to see it. But it will be like one of those crazy, what the hell what went on there? Mm. Um, yeah, it's definitely working. I mean, and I don't know, I, I'm not qualified to say how it came about. Um, I think intimidation certainly does, as you say, have a, have an effect. People are really, really terrified. Um, but similarly, I suppose sloganeering does an awful lot. You know, all of a sudden, about seven years ago, you got the phrase trans women are women just being repeated as a mantra, even though that's factually wrong. And they can't be because by definition, uh, trans women are not women. Uh, they are. Well, we don't need to get into that because, again, it's just a linguistic trick, isn't it? I mean, I can, say that, I can say that it's true or I can say that it's not true. It just depends on what I mean by the word women. That's right. It, it, it's, it's like transubstantiation. It's like saying this is the body of Christ. You, you just say it. You just assert it. You don't need to prove that it has actually physically turned into the flesh. Right. But if a woman is something different from a biological female, then you can say that trans women are women. Yeah. Okay. And it's true. If this table is a pigeon, 
and I now have my hand resting on a pigeon. But but as you know, language and, and society can't work that way. We have to have agreed definitions of things for anything to be achieved. Everyone knows that what we mean by woman, we know that it's a biological classification. And if you want to change that, that's going to be a much bigger project because, again, it's one of those things that just hasn't caught on. Like, everyone... But don't you think that, there's a, that you can have a conceptual change on the basis of one minority asserting its, you know, its different point of view about something? So, you know, homosexuals used to be perverts. Uh, that used to be a perversion, you yeah. see, sort of mental illness, right? It no longer is because gay people said, well, hang on, we're not perverts. We're just a different type, you know, but it was, but it was like, but it was eyes. No, I mean, the, the mistake there is that homosexuality was never a perversion. It was simply perceived as a perversion. So the fundamental truth of it has right, it may be the case that the concept of womanhood can be divorced from biological femininity. No, what you would have to do to sort of redefine woman as as the activists say they want it to be an essence of male or female, you would have to prove that that is in fact the authentic truth here. You would have to prove that there is such a thing as a kind of gendered soul that we have that can be uh, departed from our body. Why wouldn't you just have to prove that there is a small cohort of people who insistently and persistently, you know, claim that they are born into the wrong what does that sex body? Well, it proves that there's an existence of, of people who complicate, or to use a, a worse term, problematize. No, that's the idea that's of just, that's right? perception. So the, but the existence of transsexuals could give us grounds for changing the, way, the meaning of the word ma sure, you, ma but, man and woman. But no one's arguing against perception. I mean, I take the liberal stance on all of this. I think anyone should be able to call themselves whatever they want and identify however they want. To hear the rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com slash listen, and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff, including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing. If it was worth listening to this much of, don't rob yourself of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for Uncomfortable Conversations with Substack. Substack.